Hello, and welcome to The Range Project. This is Chris McGrory, currently a senior student athlete on the baseball team at Harvard. On the podcast, my goal is to flat out learn from those around me at Harvard and beyond. In our conversations, we uncover what amazing things my guests do and how they do it. That means learning the tactics, tools, and routines they use, plus the mental frameworks they have, so you and I can apply them in our own lives. Okay, today we have Noah Zavalis. He's a longtime friend of mine who really took me under his wing my freshman year of college when he was a senior. Over the years, he's taught me innumerable lessons on and off the field, and it always comes back to intentionality. He's clear on what he wants, so he always knows why he's doing what he's doing. Simple, but not easy. Currently, Noah is a pitcher in the Milwaukee Brewers organization, coming off of his first full minor league season where he was the Carolina League Pitcher of the Year award winner, but he won't tell you that. A right-handed pitcher from a public high school in Massachusetts to Harvard, the Cape Cod League, and now onto professional baseball, Noah has taken advantage of every opportunity he's been given and earned everything he's accomplished along the way. And let me say, this guy is dedicated. He's chasing his dream, and we dig into exactly what that is. Might not be what you expect. He also thinks about his craft in a way few others do, and you'll hear how that helps guide his decision making day in and day out throughout his career. In addition, in this conversation, we talk about how he feels like he's playing with house money right now and how that frees him up to both take advantage of every day and also roll with the inevitable uncertainties of minor league baseball. Now with that said, Noah is far more than just an athlete. Beyond the baseball, Noah is a craftsman when it comes to woodworking and a hell of a reader. So we explore what lessons he's learned from those. But at the end of the day, Noah is thoughtful and intentional about everything he does. And I hope you hear that in our conversation. So without further ado, here is One, Noah two, Zavala. Three, do it. All right. And we are live. What's up, Noah? How are you doing? Yes. Good, man. How, um, where are you calling from? Right now, you're usually I, all over the world. Yeah, uh, this, this call finds me about mm, 20 minutes north of downtown Atlanta. Um, actually in the basement of the wonderful 40 family, uh, household, uh, where I'm, I'm staying for this off season, Jake 40 and his family, um, a, you know, fellow graduate of Harvard baseball, uh, we're, we're kind True. enough to open the doors for a, an itinerant, uh, minor league <laughs> place to stay. And you were in Arizona for all Too of long. the summer. Too long. Yeah, yeah. The sun, well, the summer, yes, but also the preceding fall and part of the succeeding fall. Yeah, right. So I started in Arizona in October of 2019 and didn't leave until mid November of 2020. So 13. Did I, that means I haven't even seen you in person. Did you come up for Christmas last, sum, last winter? Yes, I don't okay. know if we know each other though. So okay, it's been too long then in person. I think it have been since since the the fall directly following the the Mudcat season. Yeah, so that means when I because I came to campus for a little bit. Yeah, yeah, far too many Facetimes, not enough real yeah. Facetime. Yeah, been a minute. Been been a long minute. Well, I'm glad we could sit down and get one on the books and recorded. And man, when I think of you i think of the underdog story and correct me fact check me if i'm wrong but mm -hmm. for you it was you were a late add to the recruiting class and that turned into becoming an ivy league cape cod league and minor league pitcher of the year is, for, is uh, that right i will interject on the uh the, the cape cod bit uh that wasn't league wide that was a, a team-based thing okay uh, but in, in some sense, that was, that was even more special. But Okay. So I guess 
does it feel like an underdog story or is that just me projecting a narrative to your baseball career? It does at times, but then I, I kind of have to check myself because I, you know, I, I can kind of look back and realize just how fortunate I've been in, you know, every, every aspect of my life. So, you know, any, any time I kind of, you know, get into my, you know, it's me against the world shit. I, I am drawn back to places like Harvard and the Cape and in pro ball and, and prior to that, you know, the formative years growing up where I've had a, a lot of angels on my shoulders. And so, yes, a, a underdog in some sense, but far more, um, you know, someone who's, who's had a lot of opportunities and, and used most of them pretty well. Um, but of yeah. course I'm the prototypical six, four pitcher that throws 98. So <laughs> I don't, I don't pass the eye test. Sure. Right. But a lot of people, I think in your shoes kind of use that as fuel. They use that. Oh, people doubted me. Oh, I'm not the prototypical. Picture. Yeah. yeah, And there, there, there are two ways to, to let that fuel you, I think. And the, the more conventional way is what you point out that kind of, um, appeal to a, a sort of deep seated anger or, or sense of unjust, you know, and, and I think, um, you know, that, that was definitely a part of it early on in college, but I think the, the larger piece or the, you know, the more productive aspect of that for me has been the realization that, you know, I'm not even supposed to be here. Like I wasn't supposed to be recruited and go to Harvard and play baseball there. I certainly wasn't supposed to, you know, in the eyes of the coaches kind of trace that, that career trajectory. And instead of using that as, as, you know, a, a you know, something I get angry about and, and use to motivate me, it's much more something that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really happy about. That it's almost like, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm living on, um, on like house money, kind of yeah, like with house money. Like I'm not even, I'm not even supposed to be here doing what I'm doing and I am. And so, you know, that, that just makes me all the more eager to, to get out of bed in the morning and enjoy each day and, and do whatever I need to do to continue living this, this crazy life of, you know, an eight year old that gets to go out and, and basically have endless recess. Right. So, right. Um, right. there, there are two ways to interpret that, that underdog deal. And I think both can be, can be very productive, but the one I have found is, is born much more out of, you know, respect and, and love for those around me than, than anger. Yeah. And I mean, we've had a full disclosure to those listening. We've had a lot of conversations. I didn't know how you're going to answer that. So like, mm -hmm. this podcast is a great excuse for me to ask my friends questions that maybe in yeah. other circumstances i wouldn't be able to ask absolutely so, we're getting uncomfortable yeah no doubt so um it's cool that you you dove into that and we'll get to the dreamer being an eight-year-old on a playground but um just to to set the scene i think of you there's this this pre-cape era in this post-cape era that's a pretty good word. yeah tell me fair. if i'm wrong and then but like dude how did you get there I mean, we have not really talked about the Cape much, and I didn't know you until this post Cape era Noah. So that's a good point. That's a good point. Okay, I keep I, I tend to think of you as someone who's who was you know saw the transition, and, and I guess that's not really accurate. So the the full story starts with John Fallon actually, and John Fallon um, is a classmate of mine. Uh, the hundred and one of the I think the hundred and fifty second captain of harvard baseball he could definitely tell you the number um <laughs> but in any case john the fallon captain my freshman year of yes, uh, yes. college uh -huh. noah and i overlapped only for one year as teammates but have remained friends for much longer right and so you walked you walked into a, a program captain by jay smooth poppy um <laughs> and, and the jay smooth poppy um persona was was kind of born our sophomore year so john and i our sophomore year we went down and played the university of florida in a weekend series and john just went off and he was the only one besides <laughs> two two of our starting pitchers that went wound up getting drafted um but john was, was i mean he just swung the bat like no one else to the point where he started to gar garner some some scouting attention from pro scouts and cape scouts you know cape coaches that were trying to put together their teams for that following summer and so the way that worked is John got a little bit interest from the Wareham Gateman, 
Um, he was he was slated to go down to Wareham that summer on a temp contract, which basically meant that they were going to give him a week or two and just kind of see how he panned out. There weren't and that's standard for Ivy League guys. Oh, very much so. Yeah, and especially at that time, because I know the the proliferation of Ivy League players on the Cape has really picked up. But at that time, Ivy Leaguers really didn't go to the Cape. Not to sure. anything. Just it just wasn't, and they, they had before, but this was kind of a lull in the Ivy's presence on the Cape. In any case, John was, you know, he was the torchbearer uh, in that sense, and so he went. He was he was slated to go down, and then late in our sophomore year, um, it might have actually been after the conclusion of our sophomore year, I was walking into the locker room, you know, in, in preparation for a season in the hockey league, which is a Boston city league. Like I, I had already set my plan up. I was going to go and play in this league. I was going to live on campus. I was going to work over at MIT and it was great. I had, you know, I had the live work play train set up all there built into Harvard. And I was, and this I was could these two leagues could not be more opposite. The Cape Cod league is the creme de la creme, the top league in the country for collegiate summer baseball, the Yaki league, you could be pitching against a D three baseball player or a 40 year old, 35, 40 year old who doesn't want to hang up the spikes. Is that right? That is the perfect way to put it. The, The juxtaposition is, is black versus white in that sense. And I was, I was looking at the Yaki league, the experience that was, that was waiting for me that summer as kind of a reclamation project because I was all over the place and I, I needed a chance to just pitch. I think I had 11 innings to my name as a college baseball player and, and just, you know, needed to go somewhere where I could stack up six innings regardless every, you know, every seventh day. Absolutely. Um, and so I was really, really excited for that. So I'm, I'm, you know, fat, I, I'm walking into the clubhouse at, you know, after baseball season is over, um, just trying to stay in shape to get ready for that Yaki season when, Coach Decker calls out to me from his office and says, Hey, come on it. <laughs> I, I walk in, you know, at this point, Decker and I didn't, didn't have much of a relationship at all. It wasn't, it wasn't positive. It wasn't negative. It just like, we didn't really interact because I didn't play. Right. Um, and that was really all there was to it. So, so I was, you know, my, I was floored when Deck said, Hey, you want to go play on the Cape? <laughs> I said, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, that must have been a dream, or like not yeah, even a dream, was, like a fantasy world. It, it was just so bizarre because it was presented so matter of fact. It was like, yeah, you know, this Wareham needs a you know a couple of arms. John's going down. They called me and, and said, you know, hey, could you could you send another pitcher? Do you know anyone? And Dick said, oh yeah, you know, I, I know Noah's from the area and he's a pitcher. Like that, those are those are the only. It wasn't, it wasn't going because of any any anything I'd done on the baseball field. It was purely the characteristics of sure. who I was. I'm like yes, sure. I throw baseball, and I'm I'm local, so it wouldn't have to. I wouldn't have to fly or do anything crazy like that. Right. And so here I was, you know, planning on spending this summer in the hockey league, and and then this this other opportunity kind of presented itself, and I pivoted. So I I, I find myself filling out host family forms, and and you know bio forms for this, this, this Cape team that like, I, I couldn't even crack the rotation on my college team. And here we are like number ones of every college team in the nation right. are going playing in the Cape. So it was a little bit like, okay, this is, I mean, I, yeah, I'm, I'm going to fill it out. And then they're going to come back and tell me yeah. like, Hey, sorry, like we found a real baseball player to take this. Spot. <laughs> yeah, These along. are teams. I, my family and I would grow up going to watch for fun on the summer yeah, these, these, are, these are teams for guys who are going to play professional baseball. These right. aren't teams for guys who want to play professional baseball. Well said. Yes. And, and there, that, that was the, the difference for me. Like I wanted to, <laughs> but I wasn't very good. And so <laughs> that's been, so hence, hence the hockey league plan. So John and I, um, we go down to Wareham. this was the, the first week they're doing kind of a training camp week. And, and all that really means is that the Wareham Gateman, go and play some other collegiate summer league teams. So not, not in the Cape, they went and played a futures league team. We went and played any CBL teams and these are just sure. other, you know, local collegiate summer leagues. So it was a good. Varying, a yeah, varying a varying. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so that's what John and I were there for. And, and we went down, John picked me up at the tra- train station in his aunt's car and we like rolled into Wareham and thought, okay, like this is, this is it. This is as close to the big leagues as, as we've ever come. <laughs> And so we got lunch and, and both went and met our host families. And, you know, we basically made a plan to, um, he was going to pick me up the next day and we met at the field and 
you know, we, we played out that week and it went really well. Uh, it went well enough for me that I was thinking they might ask me to stay, you know, and I, like I had, I was pitching out of my mind. I was, I mean, I must've thrown like five innings and struck out more than half the guys I faced. It no was, was kind of like, Oh, Whoa, I, no, I don't know what you're doing, but it's working. Yeah. Um, and so that was really cool for me. It was surprising for me too to go out there after, you know, a, an atrocious freshman year and kind of an abysmal sophomore year. Kind of nice. okay, Well, you know, like these, yeah, these, these hitters that I'm facing, they're not Cape hitters, but they're also not bad hitters. No, absolutely and I'm still not. kind of doing it. So I was, I was feeling myself a little bit to the point where I'm, you know, I'm calling my dad, I'm calling some, some strength coaches back home thinking, okay, like, how do I, like, if they ask me to stay, how do I make this work? Cause I, at mm. that point I was also trying to gain some weight back that I had lost and, and address some, some strength and, and mobility imbalances. Like I had a, a plan set up for this sure. summer. And then they pulled all the temps into a room and said, Hey, you can't stay here. So you didn't play a single Cape league game that first summer. I didn't play a single Cape league game that first week. Okay. The, the plot thickens because after they cut us, I, th- that is when I realized, okay. Th- I mean, they only ha- were planning on bringing us down for a week anyway. Sure. Like this was just to round out the roster for the training camp. They really had no intention of keeping us on past that. Which is valid. Yeah. Oh, of course. I mean, they had they had to have a number of guys, and and no, like no one um, misrepresented anything to me. This was just no. you know a giddy sophomore in college thinking, oh my god, chance. <sighs> and then there are guys coming from the college world series, right, to fill out the roster. Who right. are there still- were some of those, those kids from that Florida team that John Fallon mauled um, coming <laughs> back to play in the Cape. Thank um, you. I'll take third base back. Right. Right. And so that was. It was it was bittersweet for me because you know that that week more so more than just being a wonderful week of baseball, it was just a wonderful week in general because it was really the first time I had experienced any sort of pro style baseball because we were, you know, we played in in Bristol, Connecticut at Muzzy Field and you know we we didn't you know we stayed at the hotel and then we got on the bus and went somewhere yeah, else no doubt. there and came home so it was it's cool. you know, it gave you a little bit of a flavor for what the minors or what the big leagues would be like. And I loved it. It was great. It was really cool to just show up to the field and play baseball every day. So that, that basically instilled in me this, this certainty that there was light at the end of the tunnel, that there was, Mm. there was some promised land. And, you know, if I could just, if I could just get there, Mm -hmm. Things would be okay. So it 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 functioned for me as like this talisman when I went back after I got cut and, and went back to the Yaki League. And you know, I was I was pitching not not thinking, wow, shucks, this sucks. You know, I, I really wish I was on the Cape. And you know, while I did wish that, it was it was an avenue for me to get back there. Gotcha. Okay. So you play on the Yaki that summer, and we've talked about that. And that was a great training ground. You really got to develop your arsenal and then you finish that summer on the Cape. Is that how the story goes? What basically the, you know, if we're going to fast forward through the Yaki season, which, you know, just, just as a plug for the Charlestown townies, that was instrumental in just regaining the love of the game because I showed up to every game I pitched in and was surrounded by guys who just wanted to play baseball. They weren't there for any other reason than because they really liked playing baseball and wanted to do more of that. Right. So that was really cool to just kind of be in that environment. But then I get a text from, from the Gateman GM late in the summer asking me if I had been throwing. And of course I had, I've yes. been throwing pretty well in the hockey league and push comes to shove. I go down, I go back down for, you know, like mini tryout just to kind of verify that I had been throwing. And, yeah, you know, sure. <laughs> Your arm still worked. Yeah. And, and this, this again was presented as like, we need you to come and cover like six innings or something like that. Yeah. Are you ready to come and throw a hundred pitches if we need to? I was like, yeah, shit, I'll do anything. That's fine. And so I went down, I threw a bullpen for the tryout, went pretty well. They said, okay, yeah, you know, stay here. I was like, all right, great. I oh raced back my up God. to my apartment in Cambridge in DeWolf. Um, Cause I was living in DeWolf, cleared all my shit out stashed it at, at the house and drove back down to Wareham. Dude. And here I'm thinking like, okay, this is it. This is real Cape Cod baseball. Like yes. I'm going to pitch in the fucking Cape. And that was just kind of a wild notion. Like I just, I had just got called up. I was getting called to the show. And who was the first person you told, like, how'd you feel when you got that text? And then who was the first person you told? 
it was probably my dad because I think I think they told me, you know, we want you to stay right after the pen. I think oh they were like, hey, you know, can you like, can you can you be here by tomorrow? Uh huh. And so like I, my dad right there. <laughs> yeah. Good news and bad news. Like we got to come back. We got to go and come back. Yep. But you know, the good news is I can come back. Oh my god. And so I get back down at the end of that summer. I stay with the same host family I had uh, uh-huh. the first week. They were wonderful. The McKiernans are are my family now. So I think I I made a total of two appearances in that that like end of, last week of the regular season, first week of playoffs. First one was like an inning or two, pitched well, couldn't feel my legs. It was uh, it was crazy to be out there and like yeah. I, I mean, just major imposter syndrome. Okay, so let's get into that. Like. Yeah, this is power five guys, right? Like big conference, middle of the order hitters up and down the lineup. This is this this is the the collegiate summer league in which I, I like the first guy I faced went to the University of Texas, and then the second guy I faced was actually on that Florida team that oh we had God. played earlier in the spring that had just waxed us by ten each night. Right. So you said you mentioned imposter syndrome. Did, so you did you feel intimidated towing the rubber going up against those guys? I wasn't, I wasn't intimidated at that point. I was just trying to kind of control my breathing because right? yeah. And, and I like, I'm always, I'm, I always get worked up in the pen, like getting loose and you know, I, I, I kind of tire myself, myself out sometimes, but this was, was just like a struggle to kind of slow down. Mm. And, you know, of course, like I get the first guy, Oh, two, one, two. And I think, Oh, wow. Like, am I going to, I'm going to strike out my first guy in the cave. Yeah, right. Ooh. My best, like, 87 mile an hour heater up in the zone he me up. smashes it at the center fielder just like <laughs> this dude hit a strike to our center fielder caught <laughs> at his chest i was like oh okay i'm not doing that anymore yes uh, but after that like i got the first out on a pitch that like maybe i shouldn't have gotten back like maybe that ball should have gone 400 feet over sure. a fence yep and after that i was like okay wait a minute no like just do what you do don't try and blow anyone up right now because it's just not what you do and finish the inning. I think I might have gone back out for one more. Yeah, but that was a big, a big breath of relief. Get that first out. It's like okay, I can hang. Dude, everybody says that in whether it's in World Series games or All Star games, like big leaguers, mm-hmm. MLB debuts. They say like once you throw your first pitch or you get your first out, it's like all right, we're just playing baseball again. So, but also you're like your self awareness to realize, okay, my heart rate is through the roof let's take a breath and then mm-hmm. also the awareness to say okay noah i have 87 let's not pitch like i have 96 you know yeah that, yeah, well, that takes some awareness for a sophomore under the bright lights you could say the, the gunshot sound of a baseball hitting the barrel of a bat will make you aware <laughs> it will make you aware of of what's going on um, <laughs> and and in some sense i mean like that was a familiar familiar sound it was like, <laughs> that's dark well but but just i mean just anywhere like okay this this isn't different it's still baseball mm, oh in that gets, sense I, I still get three strikes he still gets four balls and once you realize that yes even though you know the the, the ballpark is bigger well and, and, and maybe that was another part about the cape too is that we're playing on high school fields right and so even though you've got, you know, star power, big names, a lot of scouts, all that kind of stuff, you know, the, the environment was very familiar to me because like, oh, I, I played on a Massachusetts. These, these fields were like, huh, yeah, no, I, I, I got this. Yeah. I know what this is like. They were really, really beautifully taken care of, but still. Chain link fences with yeah. wood plank grandstands, if that, you know, people. Yeah, this, like the stainless steel grandstands, um, you know, sometimes the infields were uneven or right. like, the grass was always long Interesting. and thick. Yeah. So the, like the, the power of the environment was, was very, very important, I think. Had that been a giant cavernous, like empty stadium, it would have been a different story, I think. But yes, I, I wound okay. up making two appearances in, in the, you know, the real Cape that summer. So let's fast forward to the next summer, mm-hmm. which was magical in the sense that you i presume get uh called back because all right he can pitch is that right y- yes and no so the the following summer i i knew i knew i had a like an opportunity i knew it like they they had the, the gateman had made it clear that you know in some capacity i could come back 
the the Ivy League and, and Harvard in general didn't really have a whole lot of pull with these teams to say like, hey, we want this kid on your team. And so they would take them, take take me. So I, I mean, I ended up basically calling the the Wareham GM and just asking him, hey, you know, I, I really want to come back. I just want to know if I've got a chance to right. stay on like it. You know, I just want to know if there's an opportunity for me to to play on the on the Cape beyond that training camp week. And the, the short answer I got was yes. There weren't, weren't any guarantees, but because but, I had done yeah. what I did last year, they had a little bit more familiarity with me and they were, you know, maybe a little bit more prepared to give me a little bit more rope. And that was, that was really all I needed. That was, that was all I, I wanted to hear because of course they weren't going to tell some, you know, Ivy league starter that like, yeah, your spot's guaranteed on the Cape. Sure. Got it. Right. But I knew, I knew very with, with a, a great degree of certainty that even if it was just one day, it would be worth it. Mm. And I would, I would regret not doing it if I didn't. And that's why I was, Absolutely. I was pretty, pretty bullish with, with the coaching staff and like, no, I, I'm going to do this. Um, yeah. whether, whether or not they cut me after a day or a week or a month, doesn't matter to me. Uh, it will have been worth it in the end. That circles to this concept that I, I want to dig in with you. Just this idea of confidence. It's not, when I think of you, it's not, there's no bravado, no machismo, but there is like, there's a crazy amount of confidence, dude. Like you are self-assured in, in what you're doing, how you go about your business. And you're like, all right, I'm betting on myself. I well, First of all, I appreciate that. I, I might have to deflate the balloon a little bit because in that scenario, that particular time in my, my life, I, it wasn't confidence. It wasn't, you know, I know I can do it. It was just you know, it was, it was just motivated by the knowledge that those two weeks at the beginning and the end of that summer were two of my most treasured weeks in baseball in my life. And any chance, any chance I had to, to do more of that, I was going to take. So it had nothing to do with confidence. It well, was more I, like, I, it was the confidence was secondary. Cause I knew I, I had gone the summer before and I had done it and I had done well, but it was such a small sample size. And it was, you know, part of me wanted to know like, Hey, can I, can I hang? Am I cut out for this? But even, I mean, even if I had gone, made one appearance, given up seven home runs and, you know, ran away from the field, it still would have worked. <laughs> um, and I knew, I knew that. I knew that, you know, this is, this is an, an experience I had to take advantage of for myself, you know, in, in any capacity, if they were willing to have me back, I was going back. Got you. So then maybe the confidence that I'm thinking of and maybe alluding to is really on how you went about your business when we interacted as teammates. Mm -hmm. So, so I, like when we met, we met after I had gone and, and had that summer on the Cape and, and come back with kind of a full heart, um, knowing that even if it never all again, you know, I could, right. I could look at that, that summer on the Cape and smile and know like this was, this, this was something that I didn't know was on my bucket list, but then I found out it was, and then I got to do it. Yeah. And you had a big smile a Wareham hat on and a Cape League sweatshirt. So no, <laughs> that, that navy just, blue sweatshirt dude. with a big red W on it for sure. Yep, absolutely. Okay, okay. So this is when I meet you. Like I said, there's no bravado or machismo, but it was like, okay, I know what I want to do. I'm doing it, and if that means a middle finger to other people. I think it could have been read like that. Yeah, surely it was never an intentional middle finger, but I, I'm Absolutely sure some, not. some people thought I flipped him off. Right. And I mean, we had a lot of conversations for whatever reason, you kind of took me under your wing and I kind of learned from you. So like we had that We dialogue. started when we went like that winter, right? In the bubble. Cause you probably didn't see me a whole right. lot in the fall. Cause I was wheeling around on the scooter. Yes. Yeah, we'll get to but, that. But that, yes. that winter, like you, you and I had that, that, you know, those, those empty, empty bubble days. And those were really, yes, really did. cool. Those are sick. So, okay. So people know what we're talking <laughs> about. You break your foot fall of your senior mm -hmm. year. There's disgusting x-ray footage of a screw in the side oh, of yeah. your foot. Screw bent. Uh, that was good. And, Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you're scooting around Harvard's campus on this like knee scooter in mm. a boot and you're doing like single leg workouts and MER center, like weird mobility exercises, anything you could do to like work out you were doing. And I was like, who is this kid? 
What does he think he's doing? I had never mm-hmm. seen that, yeah. you know? So yeah, where did that that come from? The I mean, the the fuck it, I'm gonna do whatever it takes kind of deal. I think I think started when I was much younger. Um, and I think in recent years I've realized that I think a lot of that has to do with not having that, you know, direct role model on the team in high school or initially in college to the point where I kind of had to be that person for myself. And I I had a lot of support from my dad and from my parents and and from people in the baseball world. But I didn't like I didn't come into to high school as a freshman and, and see this upperclassman who was, you know, like dead set on playing college baseball. They, you know, they did everything they needed to do to get there. And they took me under their wing and kind of brought me into the fold in that sense. I didn't have that. Neither did I. But what I did have is Cressy. And I was lucky enough to find Cressy Sports Performance at a very young age and was essentially surrounded by guys who wanted to do that. And, you know, I I had some of them, like I had close relationships with some of them, not not everyone, but the environment itself was such that all you had to do was walk in and you would absorb all of this through osmosis. For the people, this is the top baseball training gym in the country you see professional baseball players' jerseys Lining littering the walls, yeah. saying, thank you so much, Eric. Love the CSP team. So you're walking in to an environment with professional and aspiring yeah. professional It's the dojo. It's the players. dojo. And it's, you know, it, 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 there are two really important uh, concepts there. It's, it's not just what you do. It's not just the exercises that you're doing and the, you know, the movements, yeah. but it's how you do it too. And that I think was, yes. was maybe the most uh, influential part of it because I started there when I was 11. So everything yeah. I then came to learn about strength and conditioning, but also like how to handle yourself as a professional, how to be disciplined in, in your, you know, in your workouts, in your schoolwork, all that kind of stuff, I think either directly or tangentially was influenced by my time at Cressy's place and the people that I met there. And so that's, like drawing, drawing a line from, you know, reaching back there and then reaching forward to my senior fall when I was on this knee scooter and, you know, didn't really know what to do. You could kind of lean back on that and say, well, okay. I, I mean, I didn't have anyone holding my hand when I was in high school or when I was you know, a, a freshman or sophomore in college, you know, so I, I still had some resources in the baseball world. I still had Eric. I still had Mike Reinald at, at champion uh, PT. He was my PT guy. And together we kind of put together this um, this program, this idea like how can Noah basically not waste away while he can't put weight on his foot? And the, right. the core, you know, I think, the core part of that was just curiosity. Like I, I wanted to know how I could maximize that time, even when I was obviously on an e scooter and in a boot, and that was just super not ideal. So where, where that came from was, I guess, you know, that was the that was the status quo for me. Is that you know, mm. You're just going to figure out how to do it. And if you don't know, you're going to find someone who does, and you're going to ask them that. So you're getting as much training as you can. What what got you from where you were, great summer, but still had to had to kind of ball out in the spring yeah, to, to continue yeah. playing, to prove it and say, okay, this wasn't just like a one-time mm-hmm. thing. So what were the, what was the mindset or routines that helped you get there. You mean in so far as like what I carried into my senior spring? Yeah, like those those things that maybe the people didn't see. I mean, we talked about like the routines you would have, just your priorities. Yeah. What do you think set you apart? Well, so then I mean, if you're talking about routines, there there was there was really nothing that started my senior year or senior spring. Mm-hmm that I could point to and say like, okay, this is why I had a good senior year. Um, all of those habits right. and routines were ingrained way be before. And, and it started at Cressy. It started, you know, under, understanding what I wanted to do early on in college. And so, you know, all of those, those mixers and those final club parties, they weren't nearly as, as enticing to me because I, I kind of understood that this is time I can spend on something else that will either directly or indirectly enhance my ability to, to play baseball. And, you know, there was, there True. was time for, for everything, but I, I just made a conscious decision to a lot way more time to baseball and then a little bit more time to school to, to balance <laughs> things out. But you know, the, the, the idea that 
you know, there was, there was something that started as, you know, my senior spring that, that like carried me through it isn't, isn't totally accurate because all those things that really helped me at that really, really important time in my life were things that I had started doing, you know, because someone else was doing it or because it seemed to make sense, you know, years and years before. Yeah. So that's the, the training and the attention to detail. That's the prioritizing your sleep and your body and your nutrition through copious amounts of old bay seasoning <laughs> on dry chicken breast from no, the dining you had hall. To, you had to find some way to get that chicken down. And, <laughs> because otherwise you were going to wind up at, I don't know, Al's early on or, or Hefe's, you know, stuff that was good, but wasn't really good for you. You had to make the dining hall work for you. Yeah. Or your, your wallet would be going yeah pretty thin, pretty quick. I didn't discover Be Good until late in college. And that was a, that was a a real tough one for me because Be Good was just so great. Be Good is the health, the healthy health food, fast food, but yeah. Yeah. The place where you can get a a kale Caesar um, and you can get a, a grass fed burger on the uh, side, you know, know, just a free, free range, free range, like, egg, like a right? power bowl. If you were looking for a power bowl in the square, you would go to, would go to be good yeah. before sweet green opened up that kind of deal. But that's contrasted with my freshman year dining hall. Chicken was cardboard, yeah. soggy, not even soggy. Cause it was dry. It was, it was cardboard. Bad. Thank God. They, they hit the upgrade button the past three years and it's been better and yeah, better well, every you, year. I mean, so. you got to tell everyone about the omelet bar too, because that was, that was a huge, huge upgrade that we didn't have. And, and yes. part of that was, okay, you know, I got to make sure I get up and eat breakfast, even though I don't want to eat these, you know, cold oatmeal and hard boiled eggs for the 50th in a row. But like, <laughs> I need to put something in my body. Yes. In my time in college, they, they expanded the hot breakfast options. This is all, all to say, we just went off on a tangent you were, you were treating your body right. And right. And, and I, I guess I had, I had already learned to deal with suboptimal in high mm. school, in high school, like I had, I had more control over just about everything. And so I could, I could get to a place where I felt like, okay, I've optimized X, Y, and Z in college. It just, it just doesn't work like that. And in pro ball, it really doesn't work like that. All right. Let's yeah. let you finish your thought and then yeah. we'll get the, to pro the ball. idea there is just, you know, before I, shattered my foot, I had already learned, okay, like, how do I make this not ideal situation a little bit closer to ideal with the understanding that I'll never get too perfect. And so, you know, if I applied that to how do I stay relatively strong while I can't put weight on my left foot, it just, it made things a little bit easier to then catapult me right into the spring where I I hit the ground running. Well, not really running. I didn't do much running. Jogging, a lot of jogging or a lot of, uh, a lot of versa climbing. I hit the ground versa climbing in the mur. Um, <laughs> you dusted yeah, that and off. just kind of you know was was able to piece it together. I didn't I didn't feel like I was maybe all there as a you know a senior spring, but definitely further along, definitely in a better spot than I had you know than I had anticipated. And just to hit the uh, fast forward button, Noah dices throws a no hitter against Yale, signs a professional contract in gets drafted by the Mariners, yeah. uh, the Mariners and then traded to the Brewers. And so you talk about suboptimal conditions. There are some horror stories from minor league baseball life. You're getting paid nothing, absolute mm-hmm. peanuts. So you talk a lot about this, this dream that you have, this idea of being an eight-year-old on the, on the playground. Like, dude, minor league baseball – is hard so maybe share a story of how it's hard and then what the heck motivates you day in and day out like what is what is can you let me ask a better pointed Mm -hmm. question like what is that dream what is that dream you're chasing so this is interesting that you asked me that because one of one of our minor leagues um psychological services coordinators asked me the same thing and after a pause i i answered with him i want i want to play baseball for as long as i can i want to do as much baseball as my body will allow, as the game will allow. And, and he, he turned around, turned that around and and presented it to me as like, you know, okay, that's interesting because you didn't say immediately get to the big leagues or like sign a big deal. Mm. And I hadn't really thought about that, but the more, the more I sat with it, it really did make a whole lot of sense. You know, I, when I was growing up and, and to this day, it's never been, 
you know, I want to be a baseball player because baseball players make a lot of money or because baseball players are very famous. That that's never been the motivation. And knowing that I can kind of point to, I guess the just intrinsic joy of playing baseball. Mm. It's, you know, if, if you're asking me why I play, it's because I can't think of anything I would rather do more than this. And, you know, if, if one day I, I, some, something like that does come along that, that really you know, kind of says, Hmm, wonder why I'm playing ball when I could be doing this, whatever the other is, that's a, a bridge I'll cross when I get to it. But I've, I've been exposed to some other ways of life in, in off seasons past and in, in current off seasons. And, you know, as, as much as I have seen some things that are really cool about the, you know, the more traditional lifestyle, the, the nine to five, if you will, the fact that it gives you this stability to settle down or to, to make more money, to, you know, to put roots in ground somewhere, um, or to choose where you put your roots in the ground. All of those things are really cool. But I wouldn't trade what I'm doing for what they're doing. Because the opportunity cost for a Harvard grad is so high. I mean, you could, you have endless opportunities outside of baseball to pursue professionally, Mm -hmm. which just like makes me want to ask you even more like that dream has to be, it's, it's more than a dream. It's the knowledge. It's, it's really simple. It's the knowledge that if I didn't do it, if I didn't try, if I didn't, prove to myself one way or another that I could or could not do it, make it, I wouldn't be able to live with myself. Cause I, I mean, I'm, I'm a, a very cerebral person. I, I wonder a lot about things and I ruminate on things and oftentimes that gets me into trouble, but I know beyond the sh- beyond, beyond a shadow of a doubt that if I was, you know, if, if I had, well, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, go back, but you know, if I, if I, if I had a chance to do it and turn it down, I would have regretted it. And even mm. I, I think I would have I would felt would have felt the same way even if I was released after after rookie ball. If I had a shit first season and they were like, mm, kid can't hack it, maybe it would have been a different conversation because I would have thought, okay, well, you know, I I, I came back from a foot surgery to to get drafted. I had a really good senior year. I made it like I got to the promised land and the promised land just wasn't for me. Okay, you know, I can live with that. What I couldn't have lived with was the idea that I didn't do any everything in my power to just see, to just find out. So it's an internal like Yeah, you're you're discovering I'm discovering things about myself, I guess. It's it's not just a a you know a, a process of, you know, can I be a better pitcher? It's much more like can I can I improve myself? And that that takes a lot of different shapes on on the field, off the field, takes me to a lot of places, puts me in a lot of weird situations. Case in point, I'm living in someone else's basement and it's not the first time. <laughs> But, but then, you know, you, you also realize, okay, yeah, uh, on the one hand, it would be really cool to have a, you know, a nice apartment and a lease, but over the course of my tra- uh, travels in baseball, I have gained three, four host families that, you know, I'm, I'm in contact with to this day. They're part of my family. Like they'll, they'll be at my wedding. So when you, when you think about it like that, I mean, the opportunity cost is it's dollars and cents if I hadn't mm. pursued this. Uh, whereas if I hadn't pursued this, it would be, you know, some, some people in my life that I wouldn't have met that would not be part of my family. And that that's a really sobering thought too. Just how far will you go? As far as the damn thing takes me until, I mean, until someone takes the Jersey off my back or my arm or body says, nah, dude, you can't do this anymore. There's no reason to not. Does that mean playing independent ball in the middle of nowhere america does that mean going over to japan to play in a league overseas so this is this is a an interesting route that baseball can take you because obviously baseball has taken me to some some weird corners of the u.s some places i would never have otherwise seen and i was i was thinking just recently about okay you know if the scenario comes to pass where for whatever reason you know i, I just i I don't make it or I, I do, but I don't stick Some, something like that where it's like towards the objective end of a career, you can use baseball to take you some pretty wild places. And, you know, play, playing in, in um, Korea is pretty tough. I mean, those are, those are really, really good leagues, but there's, there's, you know, professional or semi-professional baseball in a lot of different places. Mm. And, you know, playing a season in Australia or Mexico or yeah. Sweden or Holland 
you know, there there are some some emerging baseball countries too, where this this game, you know, whether whether you're playing or whether you're coaching or whether you're functioning as sort of an ambassador, you can use the game to, you know, to just take you to some places. And as someone who really hasn't traveled much beyond, you know, minor league cities in the US, that's kind of appealing as something to do, you know, as a way to leave the game on a really cool, uh, on, 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 on very mutually beneficial terms. Like if, if at some point it becomes clear that the, the big league dream isn't going to pan out, then it doesn't really make sense to me to leave the game bitter as as someone who didn't make it. Why not spin it off into you know making it my own or making yeah. it on my own as a as a you know in a different capacity? Because if you, I mean, what what you're going to carry with you, what players carry with them after they're out of the game, is the stories. If right. You play, That's an interesting. If you play a decade in pro baseball and you don't have any, if you don't have some some really fucking good stories, you did it wrong. Right. And. I think that would be that would be a really cool way to collect some stories. We've got the that Brewers, is cool. The Brewers have some guys over in Australia right now. This is all to say Noah was the uh, Carolina League Pitcher of the Year last year. This is not like he's thinking about his his uh, his That's future. The best guy not good enough to move up though, which is okay. which is which is what my strength coach told me when that was uh, announced. Yeah. At, at the end of the day, minor league, there, there are two leagues. There's the minor leagues and there's the big leagues. Yeah. And anything that happens in the minor leagues doesn't mean shit. And so while, while it was, it was really, really cool to win that award and have that kind of cap off a, a year. Um, you know, it, it does speak to the fact that no one wants to be the minor league player or pitcher of anything. You want to be a big Got player. you. So there's always, Got there's you. always another hill to climb. And that's, what's, what's really exciting about baseball. Well, maybe in a sharper transition, you're not just a baseball player. You have, you have a lot of different identities, most prominently, I would say, um, for, those, for those that know you and maybe follow you on Instagram, they see your, your craftsmanship with woodworking. I know right now I have a Louisville Slugger wine stopper mm. on a bottle of wine on the counter great christmas gift for the parents yeah. absolutely love it. for my dad really yeah, he's yeah, like sure. this is sick and i was like oh noah made it he goes you're kidding me you know so can you share share how you got into word working and then also what let me ask a pointed question like what does woodworking give you uh, I guess I'll answer the former before the latter. And so the, 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 the easiest answer to the former is that I grew up surrounded by people who, who made things, who worked with their hands, by, by craftspeople. My mom was and is a big knitter. My dad had a toolbox for electrical, plumbing, woodworking, um, exterior, interior, paint cans, you know, anything. We, we, I, I, lived, I grew up in a you know, very, very old farmhouse that was you know, the fairer side of ramshackle, I'd say. <laughs> and I, I loved it. I loved that place to death. Uh, and it, it gave me this opportunity to explore some different modes of, of working with my hands. My granddad built, um, built sailboats. My grandmother was a, a potter and a sculptor. And so no this was, you know, this was something that it's in your blood. Yeah. It was, it was around me, even if I, as a kid didn't really understand that, you know, this was a, this was an enormous influence in my life because it was just taken it was taken for granted in the best way is that yes, that like I am a person and as a result, I will make things like that's what, that's what my people do. Um, and that, but that was never explicitly stated. It was never, I was never handed a piece of wood and said, Hey, go make a birdhouse, um, as like something that I was expected to do. It just kind of came naturally to me, but it was fostered. Like I went to, um, I went to art camps. I went to woodworking camps. I did a lot of volunteering at those camps later on. And, you know, it, that, that was a, a really significant part of my life. Uh, and then throughout my adolescence and, and then, you know, in college, I was able to continue that, that woodworking aspect, mainly because Acton Boxborough Regional High School had one of the last industrial arts programs in the state, I think. No way. And when I walked into that wood shop, you know, it was just high ceilings, lights everywhere, new power tools. And I was, I was a kid in a candy shop as a freshman. <laughs> I think I, I think I took, I took every course they offered. And then I TA'd in, in that. Oh in my that God. Room. 
Um, so I was able to continue it through high school and then I get to college and lo and behold, Elliott house is a wood shop, which is something I knew when I, when I committed to Harvard, uh, but didn't take any advantage of as a freshman because I was up in the yard and that was, that was not smart of me to not at least pop in and say, Hey, like, I'd really like to use this space. But once I was, I you know, was fortunate enough to be placed in Elliott. I was there every Tuesday and Thursday night until I graduated. And so that was, you know, how, how did, how did it come about? It started early and I was really fortunate to have the, the facilities because, you know, a wood shop is not an, is not a portable thing. You don't have no. a lot of them. Um, so I was, I was very, very fortunate to have access to those, um, those amenities. And then what, I mean, what it, what it gives me is I guess this, this outlet besides baseball or, or I guess it, you know, a, an easier way to put it is it gives me everything baseball does, but without the performative aspect, because in baseball, you know, you have your games and, and especially as a pitcher, you are alone out there uh, on the, on the mound and everyone can see when you screw up, everyone can hear it when that ball comes off the bat, like a gunshot, but, but on the same token, you know, pitching is a craft just as woodworking is a craft what woodworking does is it, you know, it, it allows you to practice your craft and refine it without anyone watching you and evaluating you and judging you. And so when you, when you remove that piece of it, you get to something that that's done just kind of for the intrinsic good of it. Or at least that's, that's what I found is that, you know, when you're, when you're standing at the lathe and, and feeling the tool and listening to the wood and, and, you know, how, how the, the process of creation is making you feel uh, and then how, the, the product itself functions as kind of an extension of you, of yourself. You get a, a very tangible, you know, finished product that you don't in baseball. You know, yes. You can, you can look at the box score and say, Oh, wow. And you know, this guy pitched pretty good because he threw six, but, out of this, but ultimately it's that's in the ether. You know, it's, it's when, when it's, when it's, Oh, when it's in process, you can see the, you know, you can see it, but when it's done, it's gone. Whereas um, in the wood shop, that's that's not true. You can see it in process, and then you can hold it when it's done. And I think that's a really um, a really cool part of it. You, and sometimes you can also use it when it's done. I've turned myself a couple bats that I've then gone and taken you know taken some swings with, and that was really cool to those looked really cool. Yeah. You made your own logo. Oh you yeah, different crazy you colors. Me. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do like just the one thing. If I, if I make no. that, I'm then going to paint it. I'm going to design a logo. I'm going to get someone in Britain to custom die cut those logos and ship them to me. Yep. Absolutely. You're going to do it right. Yeah. You're going to do it right. For sure. For sure. But, but I, I really do think that, you know, well, well at times wood woodworking and, and craft in general has um, allowed me to pour some, some frustration from baseball into a different outlet and, and work through it that way you know, you, you get this synergistic effect and I don't want to say the more, you know, I work with my hands, the better I play. I think that would be a little bit too, um, too direct and maybe not as right. Uh, not, not faithful to the, to the true meaning of, of craft. Like I don't, I don't work in the wood shop because I want to be a better baseball player. I do it for its own enjoyment, for my own enjoyment. So there, there's a, there's a really special kind of creative feeling you get when you're, when you design something and you build it and it comes to fruition and there it is. And you can, you can then speak to the process. You can, you can explain how and why you thought that this thing was important to bring into the world. And I think in, in some very, very minute way, you do change the world when you bring something original into it. Mm. You know, I have, I have turned bowls that you know, I, I'm very, very proud of, and I can point to it and speak about it and tell its story. And in that regard, it's, it's part of me. And it's part of me that in this case, I guess, sits on my mom's mantelpiece. Right. But it is a very important thing to me. It's something that I spent like that, that represents my, my creative juices, my thought process, the time I used, the time I decided to, to spend on it as opposed to anything else. Um, you know, I thought that this idea that I had was important enough for me to bring it into the world. So tell me, how do I start? I had, I, you, you, you said that it's this outlet that you had outside of baseball and throughout high school, for me, that was the basketball court mm -hmm. that was, I could pour into getting good grades. There were these other things that 
priorities change in college and then I'm injured coming into college. Mm-hmm. I have an identity crisis. Like I can't play baseball. What do I, and I didn't feel like I had anything else. Right. And that was really hard. I mean, throughout high school, I would strum on the guitar and like, I like to read, but like, those aren't, those aren't. Yeah. Well, the, the thing identities the thing in the same way, I mean, like basketball is the same as baseball in that right. it's a, it's a competitive sport. Um, and so it, it gives you the same things. Great. Like schoolwork. I, I don't count because that's something that whether you like it or not, you've got to do it. You're not exactly. That. And so exactly. I do think there's an element of choice to it in that it's, it's really important that whatever you're doing, whether you're turning something on the lathe or, um, or, or strumming the guitar, anything, any of those creative pursuits, it's important that that's something you've chosen because you want to do it. Like my, my younger sister, she has just recently got into upcycling clothing. She'll find clothes. She'll, she'll go to like a dollar store and get like an old yep. t-shirt and you know, whether, whether it's like heat transfer vinyl or hand painting herself, she'll paint shoes. And this is, this is very, very new to her, but it's something that she chose. And even though she's yeah. surrounded by, you know, me doing all my stuff, this is something totally foreign to any, to, to me and to anyone else in our family. So that, you know, like when you ask, how do you start? It starts by finding something that you really want to do. And then after you do that, you don't have to do anything else because It'll you just, will want to. Dude, that's kind of what this podcast has become. Yeah. It's learning a new, a new craft in the sense that I had no idea how to record or edit or ask questions. Right. Uh, I mean, just like you can find studying in anything. Yeah. Studying like what makes a good question? Like, Mm -hmm. Oh my God, this is not a conversation. This is closer to an interview that people want to listen to, you know, there's an art to it. Oh, absolutely. Um, So while I think I am attracted to like you making something physical Mm -hmm. that can be put out there. I think this, this podcast is kind of, offering me and, something similar. Yeah. Well, and, and, and maybe physical isn't the right word either, because what I, what I hope to evoke with the word physical is something you'll still get as a podcast because 20 years down the road, you'll still be able to dial this conversation up and say, like, yes. Hey, Noah and I had this conversation. And yes. in, in that sense, maybe it's, it's more of a tangible thing. Mm. Like someone, someone can go and relive this conversation. Whereas I, I guess you can you can rewatch a game, but I can't repitch it. Uh, right. I can get kind of close by rewatching and kind of remembering and and all that. Right. Right. Just different. It's different. Um, mm-hmm. So I mean, I think I think you're you're getting that that physicality or that tangible aspect of your craft um, because again, you can you can go back and and evaluate yourself, evaluate others, and and refine it as you see fit. Yes, and that's the biggest thing is like continually improving finding there's just so many different layers to where you can get better right finding like somebody who's an expert mistakes out you can just double down on going back and starting fresh and that's i guess that's the the thing about you know the 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 hold up with sports is that you can't do that right once it's done it's in the books and good or bad it's going to stay there you have you have to face it at appointed times there's something beautiful about that but i think having another outlet is important Right. I don't think one is necessarily objectively better than the other. It's just important to acknowledge that, you know, this, this gives me that. And the other thing gives me something slightly different. And sometimes they work in tandem and sometimes they don't, Yep. but you gotta, you gotta have a, you know, a generous eye towards both of them. Got you. Well, can I now ask you some rapid fire questions that don't have to be rapid fire answers Mm -hmm. but they we're gonna we're gonna bounce around a little bit my first question would be voracious reader that you are what are one to three books that have greatly influenced your life um let's see so I guess I, I would start with the you know some, some two books that that hit me at the right time I guess um, and they're they're wonderful books in their own right but they were particularly salient to me because of when I read them um, and that's Grit by Angela Duckworth and The Art of Fielding by Chad Harbach and I, I think I read Grit before The Art of Fielding but but in any case both books kind of verbalized some things that I had been feeling 
because of, you know, struggles with baseball and, and just kind of not getting anywhere, even though I knew I was doing the right things. And so, so grit deals with this idea that passion and perseverance equals grit. Basically that's the, right. The easy formula. Um, yeah. Passion and perseverance for your long-term goals. Yeah. yeah. And you had all of those ingredients, right. at least how you, I you want to, you have a long-term goal. You want to succeed. Like this is how you do it. And, and it's, it's easy to break it down like that. It's much harder yeah. to actually live by that. Um, but what it, what, what that book did was give me those terms and a, you know, a mm. clearer way to understand, you know, whether I, whether I was or was not doing the right things and how to evaluate that. Um, and, and, you know, sort of, sort of reaffirm for myself that yes, in fact, okay, this is, you know, this is, it's a, it's a rocky road, but it's still one that, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try and, and follow. And then the art of fielding is actually a novel written by Chad Harbach who lived in Lull house. Um, there we go. And that's, that's, I think really the only book I've ever reread and I've read it a bunch of times. I uh, try and try and do it like, I don't know, once every six months, something like that. And I think a lot of it is, is just because of some of those lines and some passages in there that I, I almost know by heart, but that really speak to, some, some different aspects of both the, my baseball career, as well as, you know, just, just life in general. Um, and that's not to say that this book is, you know, a, a biblical text by any means, and it probably won't be understood in the same way by a lot of other people, because you kind of have to have this, um, you know, a, a similar, a similar understanding for the, the story arc of the main character, who's, you know, a, a nondescript high school baseball player, gets just, you know, a, a smidgen of a chance to play in college and then, you know, creates a, a very good baseball player where before there was not one. Um, but, but in doing so this, this book kind of details the trials and tribulations that, you know, elite athletes face, uh, both on and off the field and how, you know, how, how doubt plays a, a huge role in the, the same sort of confidence that you, that you mentioned, you know, Henry, I think is, is a very confident player only because he's got so much doubt and that, you know, that doubt causes him to work harder and harder and harder so that he earns his own confidence. But then, you know, you get to a, a tipping point. So without, without ruining the whole story, um, that was, that was <laughs> another book that maybe, maybe in the same way that like, I can't remember any single quote from grit besides the formula. I can remember a lot of quotes from yeah. the art of fielding, because they run so, so parallel to my own life, I think, and my own experiences. Can you share one? Um, not, not word for word, but there was, there's a, a passage Harbach writes about where, you know, words, w words are, are not something that you can kind of test the waters with. You just have to throw Ooh. them out into the world and hope that someone catches them kind of. And, and Henry has, has struggles with throwing a baseball. He gets the yips. Um, and it's the same kind of thing. You know, when you throw a baseball, you have to throw it out in the world and hope someone's on the other end to catch it. You know, hope it makes it. But after you let go of that baseball, you have no control over it. The wind could take it, mm. bust a seam, anything. Whatever. And it can run, it can cut, it can sink, rise, whatever. And words are the same way. Is that once you say them, you know, presumably you have said them with, um, with honesty and clarity. And if, if that is the case, once you've said them, then you're free of them. Yep. And, and that in and of itself is a, a generous act to put that into the world, but the understanding and the, um, the serenity to accept that once you've let go of them, they're someone else's. So next book, um, is actually one that came to me from your podcast. So thank you to the pod, as well as Matt Thomas and Garrett, um, last name unknown. Garrett Walker, episode one. Yes. Ep one. So, I had never really done a whole lot of reading about Mandela and growing up in, uh, yes. um, you know, we, we had history, we had world history, we had a lot of pilgrims. Yeah. Yeah. The, the kind of the standard whitewash story that everyone gets. And so it wasn't until I picked up this 900 page um, biography called the long walk, a long walk to freedom by Mandela that I started to understand what apartheid was and, and how, how deeply ingrained it was in that society 
even, I mean, as, as late as the seventies and eighties, um, here, 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 we think that, you know, the revolutionary war happened and then the civil war happened. And after the civil war, like slavery was over. That was kind of the way I had, I had always, that was my worldview is that slavery was over after the civil war didn't exist. And maybe it didn't, you know, it didn't exist by that name in the U S that's a whole different conversation, but it still very much did exist in a, in a, like an institutionalized way in South Africa. And so Mandela's biography or autobiography read kind of like a novel to me because I was so totally ignorant of all of this right. that right. I flew through this book kind of sitting there like, Ooh, like what's, what's Mandela going to do next? Like, this guy's a <laughs> Great story. Who, who would yeah, it was, it was an awesome story. And then I realized, shit, this all happened. Yeah, this is real. That's heavy, and that you know, truth is stranger than fiction. My buddy says it just needs a better editor. But <laughs> the point, the point is, it was such a powerful book because it was a real book. Um, and what what stuck with me about Mandela himself was his insistence on, you know, uh, ev- evoking change through like mutual healing. Essentially, is that he didn't he didn't want his side to, to vanquish the other side. It wasn't a game of wins and losses to him. It wasn't zero sum. It was right. Right. And that was, that was really powerful coming from a man who spent two decades in jail. Um, like this wasn't a guy who just said, Oh yeah, you know, this would, this would be nice. This is the way I think I want to handle it. I mean, the, the dude was made to endure some, some incredible atrocities and, and that's, you can, you can read the book for those, but the, just the, the way he comported himself in, you know, in getting to a point where, you know, the, the true change of society was only going to come about by both parties getting to a point of coexistence yeah. was very, very powerful to me. Um, when, so that, when do you read, how do you get through all these books? Um, whenever I've, I've always, I've always liked to read before bed. Okay. I really do like to read, you know, evenings and nights. So like sometimes after dinner, I'll just pick a book up. Gotcha. And not put it down for a couple hours. And that's, I'm trying to think of like when I, when I read or when I would read during the baseball season, bus rides, big time hotels, not so much before games, but there were, there were, there, there were a couple starts there where I'd break out a book. Um, just to, just to show the, the guys in the clubhouse. Oh, I went to Harvard just, just in case I forgot. Yeah, I mean, usually, usually try and find a quiet place to read, so I would get as far away from the clubhouse as I could. Um, but I think that also that also had a, a dual function of taking my mind off the game at hand, and so I was able to build in a little bit of stillness to an otherwise, you know, high testosterone uh, day. You know, the start start day every fifth day is is just a little different. So having having some some calm in the eye of that storm was really important. Are there any other tactics you use to cultivate that stillness? Do you meditate? Do you? Well, I started, I started trying to take naps. Um, I was, I was in, in Arizona for instructs and instructs are, are a morning deal. So normally you play your games at night during the season, 7 PM games, but from the beginning of October through the middle of November, we basically played a, a very abbreviated season against some other teams. And all these games were at like 11 AM or 1 PM, but you had to be there. We had to be there really early because we had to get testing done. Right. And so our days were kind of stretched out yep. to the point where is, you know, if I, if I was going to pitch a one o'clock game, I would have to be at the complex ready to spit in a tube at seven forty-five in the morning. Right. So, that's a long day. That, that was the problem because especially during the during the real season, if you're the starting pitcher that day, all you have to do is be on the mound to throw the first pitch. Like no one cares when you show up, what you do. I mean, if if you need to, um, you know, do whatever ritual you have, you know, light a t-shirt on fire outside the clubhouse. Go for it. Game, as long as you put up a quality start. You know, <laughs> you so so that's where the naps came in. It's like it's seven in the morning. I'm I'm tired, so I. I would, you know, I would go, I would test, I would have breakfast and I would find a quiet spot and just try and take a nap. Interesting. Um, Clear your mind. Just, yeah, that can, that's a little bit more dangerous just cause you can wake up a little groggy. Um, I didn't love that, 
But again, you know, it's, it's one of those things that you can, you can build into your routine or not. It's entirely up to you and, and what feels right. I think reading is a lot easier because you don't have to worry about, you know, how you're going to wake up or anything like that. Um, it's also easier to find a spot to read than it is to sleep for me. Gotcha. Interesting. Next question. We haven't been in the same space in a few years. What is a new belief, behavior, or habit that has particularly improved mm -hmm. your life? So you knew me as a gimpy right-handed pitcher who wouldn't, you know, just wouldn't run if, if he had to do it to save his life. Um, I was just so not in a space where running and, and pounding on my feet was something I wanted to do. The, most, well, the, I was, the showcase jog. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it worked out okay because as long as I was pitching good, I really didn't have to run anywhere. Gotcha. Um, didn't have any bases and that was, that was good. That, and, and I think that, that really has been one of the most influential changes I've made in my life period is just starting to run. Um, cause even, even before I broke my foot, I wasn't a, I wasn't someone who would just like go for a run. It just wasn't a, a thing I would do. I was, I was a very active person, but running wasn't the way I did it. And I guess it would have been late summer. I would, I was, would have been still in Phoenix at that point. I just started going for runs in the evenings and it was always the evening. So the, the nighttime bit factors heavily, certainly, but I think, I think learning to, to move my body in that way has been a really important aspect of my baseball career too. And you know, I, I guess I really didn't have that. I didn't have another sport. Like you played basketball in high school. You knew what it was like to, to shoot a perfect jump shot or to, you know, to cross someone up. There was, you, you there had was no jump. I did not have a license to shoot outside of the paint, but thank you. Okay. All right. Fair enough. But, but in any case, you weren't, you weren't a one trick pony. You weren't just a right-handed pitcher, which is about as specialized as you can be. Gotcha. Right. Yep. So for, for the majority of my life, like the only thing I was really good and coordinated at was throwing a baseball with my right hand and I could and can make a baseball do a lot of different things, but that was really the only way I knew how to organize my body in a, you know, a, a cohesive and fast and athletic. <laughs> yeah. And in, in, in like, you know, that's the only thing I did that might've looked like poetry. <laughs> um, everything else is just like, mm, just doesn't look like an athlete. Right. right? <laughs> Or, or I guess like I, I had a decent, I have a decent looking jump shot. It just never goes in. So the, the point there is I think running more has allowed me to be much more in tune with how I run and how I move when I run and like, what, what feels right. So I'm, I'm evaluating myself and the way I move, but I'm also just kind of doing it for fun. I don't keep track of distance or time or anything like that. Mm. <clears throat> I just, I just throw some songs on, throw some music on and just wait for the song to go down. Feel like your body, feel your body moving kind of. Yeah. I feel like I, I and I, I feel my body moving as it was designed to. That's the thing is that, you know, we were not put on this earth to throw baseballs. Our, our anatomy is nope. not set up to do that, No, but it is set up to run. And the, and, and so these, these are not, you know, long, slow distance runs. These are much more um, like, eighth mile almost sprints and then walk a little bit and then do another one and then walk a little bit, you know, just, and, and like, that's how I get my distance for right. that day, whatever it is. But you, you know, I've started to feel like the legs, the, the anatomy of the, the body work to that's do so that. I mean, cool. why, why do we have so many little bones in our feet to cushion the impact? Dang. And it, it like, it all starts to make sense to me, like how, how we're put together to do this activity. And I think there's, there's something very um, cohesive about that. Very, very primal too. It's like, okay, this is, this is how I'm supposed to move. Yeah. However, however, the fact of me came to be on this earth, uh, someone definitely said like, okay, we're making this bone, this length and this bone, this length and we're fitting together this <laughs> to, way to do this thing. Yeah. So that this dude, not to throw a baseball, like that's stupid. Don't do that. Run. That's what you're supposed <laughs> to do. <laughs> That's what, that's what, that's what, um, natural selection and evolution gave us yes. is this ability to move our bodies for that purpose, that's to so. run away from something chasing you or to hunt something else down. Yeah. And on top of that, man, it's, it's meditative, whether you're on the lathe mm -hmm. or you're just feeling the song, feeling your body move fast. Like, sure. You might it's not sit down, 
you might not sit down and stare at the back of your eyelids for 10 minutes, but for however long you're running, like you're meditating. If you're on the lathe, you're meditating. You're you can find stillness in whatever you're doing. And for me, it's much easier to do it while I'm running. While I'm while I'm moving almost as fast as I possibly can. Yeah. And that's really cool too. It's super dangerous when it's, you know, because these, these are all at night and I <laughs> can't see the road and I'm just hoping I don't hit a crack or something and go ass over tea kettle. But the 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 points at which I am I am just kind of booking it and running as fast as I fucking can. That's where I feel the most still. Oh. And it it's really cool to to be in that zone, especially at night too. I think that's the biggest draw is that it, you know, feels like it's just you alone in the darkness kind of burning it up. Have, and you, have you read this book, Stillness no. is the Key by Ryan Holiday? No, I have not. That's on the list now. This needs to go on your reading list, not to go back to books, yeah. but it talks about, yes, it gets into like a chapter or two on like the Eastern traditions, what you think of when you're like, ooh, meditation, stillness. Mm-hmm. But it goes into stories of presidents and what their hobbies were. It goes into finding stillness in a walk in nature. It, mm-hmm. I mean, Winston Churchill, I think he was, he, his hobby was like laying bricks and he found stillness that oh, way. Yeah. So just, oh, sure. just stuff like that. that so, yeah. This is Dude, desolation like that. Mm. This oh, is, I get it. Okay. So, um, I wasn't, I wasn't going to mention it for fear of seem, seeming, you know, ignorant, I guess, but I'm like 15 or 20 pages into the power of now by Eckhart Tolle, um, which two different people in my life have strongly recommended to me. That's when you know. And, yeah. And, and neither of them, they're, they're very different people. Um, to the point where like, it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have expected <laughs> both of them to recommend this specific book, but I, I've, I've started it. And as best I can glean from just like the first couple pages is this, um, I think, I think Toll calls it being as opposed to stillness, but the idea that, you know, we are not our minds. And so when we start to watch the thinker, like watch yes. the wheels spinning up top yes. from some other vantage point, we almost free ourselves up for things like creativity and emotion, um, inspiration. Oh, that's good. Like those things to bubble up. And I think that is, a, you know, in large part, what I get from these runs is that I, you know, I, I am thinking and sometimes I have some cool thoughts that I write down, but you're seeing yourself think. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some, some really contrived situations come up. Like, I, I don't know if it's like things coming out in the, in the, in the, in the wash. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> but it's all, it's almost like, you know, every, every thought that didn't fit in my, you know, processing center was kicked back into, in, you know, into a basket. <laughs> and by virtue of finding the stillness in my runs, I'm then able to, you know, put some of these pieces together in interesting and, and new and different ways that I, you know, would never have thought to like, huh, I wonder if I had this conversation with this person about this, like, how would that go? And then I, imagine that kind of stuff dude um that's a gift so you, yeah you get some like wow this is really bizarre like i'm never gonna send that text or i'm never gonna have this conversation but i have a decent like i have a better idea now how it would go than i did before i went for this run and kind of shut everything off and let let the subconscious just kind of swirl around in itself yeah turn off that analytical overthinking brain and let the or just stop listening to it mm. Cause it's all, I mean, it's always going to be processing. That's what, that's what the thinking part does. It takes an in information, it processes it and it spits it back out, but that's not necessarily. And I think that's what Toll's point is in just the first few chapters is that that's not you. That's something your brain does, but that's not fundamentally uh, you. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Dang. That's a gift that you found that in this new habit in the past few months. Let's say. Yeah. Now, final, final question or two, just to wrap up, are there any mantras or quotes that you write underneath your cap? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A weird baseball tradition for those who might not be familiar. (laughs) 
Yeah, well, and, and baseball is weird to begin with because we wear caps, right? I mean, <laughs> who does you that? can't like if you're a football player. You can't just take off your helmet and look in and be like, oh, yeah, OK, and then put it back on mid game. Right. That's not how it works. That's a penalty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A baseball player, like there's so many pauses in the game. You pick up, you take your hat off, you wipe the sweat off and you look inside. And that's normally where people write things on the brim or in, in the actual bowl. The first thing for me is the number. I always put my number down because the worst thing you can do is, you know, come in from an inning or, or like go out for another inning and just you grab the hat that's nearest to you. You put it on and someone else's sweat Wrong. is just yep. all over your head and you know it immediately. Nope. And you're just uh, like, this is uh, it's, the worst. Nuts. it's the worst. Okay. Right. Number. Yeah. Number. You start with the number, but then the other, the only two other things I write are in very small text, be where your feet are. Uh, which is one of the the first and best pieces of advice I got in pro baseball and, and just kind of speaks to the fact that in this game and in this life, you really have no control over <clears throat> where your feet wind up on a day to day and an hour to hour basis that can change. And so you just kind of roll with it. And that's, you know, that's the beauty of it is that you can, you know, if they, if they tell you, Hey, uh, you're starting at Tacoma tonight and you're at Everett, Washington, two, two hours away. Just get an Uber. You know, like you, they'll pay for it. You don't have to worry about it. But you know, at the end of the day, worrying about or thinking about all of the, the logistics of, oh, shit, like I'm, I'm going here. That's different. How do I handle this? Mm-hmm. Drive yourself nuts. You Watch just it. be where you are. You show up to the gate in your street clothes and say, hey, I'm supposed to pitch on that field in an hour. And you hope the attendant lets you in. <laughs> And usually they do. Yeah. That was, that was a wild night. But then the other one is I am my own maker. And I think that that's kind of a, you know, a fundamental desire to hang on to this idea that I have some agency in the world, that it's not, it's not all predetermined. And to the extent that I can control parts of my career and my personal life and all of those things, you know, I, I am a small part of this universe, a very, very small part of it, but a part nonetheless and the the choices I make and the actions that I put out into the universe are my own. They're not they're not someone else acting through me. They are me. They're they're representations of the fundamental nature of me. And you know you can you, you can you can hang on to that on the mound or not. And you know in baseball maybe that's like this is my changeup. It's no one else's. It's not a changeup. It's my own. But in, in the world, it's, you know, it's one of those things that you hang on to. It's like, yeah, this shit matters. Every, every day is, a, you know, is another chance to, to be yourself and to do what you love to do. And I think that quote, I would imagine, works for you, but it only works because you have this understanding of just how much is outside of your control. So yes. you're, making, you're not making the circumstances. You're not changing your environment. No, you're changing you, what you can do. Right. On, on, on any given day, you know, you show up to the ballpark and very little is is under your control. You can you can control when you get to the park. You can control what you do in the weight room. You can control how you throw it in catch play. And then if you're not if you're not playing that night, if you're not pitching that night, you just watch a baseball game and that's your day. If you are pitching that night, you better be on your shit. Um and but but there again, I mean, you can control making the pitch you want to make, but then once, like we talked about, once that ball leaves your hand, you can't control it. Gotcha. You can make the pitch. The guy could hit it, hit it over a fence. You could not make the pitch, and he could swing and miss at it. it. You know, it's it's out of your control. So you just use it as information. I am my own maker. Yeah, I like it. Well, dude, and it has maker in it. And I like that. Yeah, the craftsman in you. Yeah. An appeal to the craft ethos. Go make something, people. That's what I'm going to try and do with this podcast. Man, thank you. I wouldn't have wanted anybody else to kick off uh, round two of the podcast. So thank you. Thank you big time. Uh, Oh, I I appreciate you asking me. I'm honored to be. I appreciate all these conversations, all the FaceTimes we've had, and I'm just happy we could uh, lock one down and record it and put it out in the world. Absolutely. All right, boss. See who catches it. Appreciate you. Thank you as always um, for the wisdom and yeah. be well. Yeah. You as well. See you brother. All right. Take care.